we grew that business to about 50,000 a month in revenue. I'd rather sell products that, you know, make me 20, 30 or or $40 or more in, in profit. You know, there's over 400 print on demand suppliers that exist. And I'm not sure if people, if people know that. One day we had a really profitable business and the next day eBay basically shut us down. My guest today on Print and Demand Wisdom was Joe Robert, and he's got a very interesting, unique approach to Print and Demand, which is hopefully going to help a lot of you out. We have a focus in this conversation on selling high profit items, where to source them, common beginner mistakes, as well as how to actually market your products effectively, even without a marketing budget. Talk to me about your story. How did you get started with Print and Demand? I, I started. I started Print on Demand. Uh, back in late uh, 2016, um, I previously to to POD, I had been uh, running an eBay store. Uh, my my wife and I were uh, running it together. This was before we had children. Uh, we were selling electronic cigarettes um, on eBay. We were ordering them, you know, basically direct from suppliers and then listing them on on eBay, shipping everything ourselves. We had like a uh, like the a second bedroom in our home, which ultimately became uh, my daughter's bedroom when she was born as like a little shipping facility uh, where we had like shelving for, you know, all the inventory and all the boxes. We had label makers and all that. And uh, we, we grew that business to uh, about about 50,000 a month in revenue. Um, and it was a busy, busy business because we were, you know, shipping everything ourselves. Um, ordering the inventory, organizing it, putting it in boxes every day and, and bringing it to the post office. And we um, we actually lost that business. Uh, eBay changed their policies. They, they stopped allowing electronic cigarettes uh, to be sold on on eBay. Um, and, you know, basically overnight, we, you know, the one day we had a really profitable business and the next day eBay basically shut us down. I started to, you know, basically investigate like, how to sell products online. Um, and I, and I stumbled across, um, tons of YouTube videos, uh, people talking about Shopify, people talking about social media marketing. You know, this was, you know, like I said, like the summer of 2016 at that point. And, um, this is when like the drop shipping boom, I guess, like was like really taking off. Um, Shopify was, you know, kind of new, I guess, or it was new to me. It felt like it was new at the at the time. Um, I forget when Shopify actually came out, but um, I discovered POD through through that. Um, I'm someone that uh, I've also done graphic design for quite a long time. I started doing graphic design when I was 12 years old, and uh, when I discovered, you know, that with print on demand, you could work with a supplier, you could use your own designs, you could sell lots of different products, and you never had to manage the inventory like I was used to doing. Um, and with with Shopify, you could build your own store and not have to, you know, be at the mercy of a platform like eBay, like I was used to, you know, being frustrated with it. It was kind of like the perfect, um, the perfect uh, opportunity. Um, and, and, and like I said, this was this was, you know, pretty new. Printify had only been around for about a year. Uh, Amazon merch was about a year old at that point as well. And um, doing print on demand on Etsy was was not even really a thing back then. Um, it was pretty much just handmade stuff. POD suppliers did not have integrations with Etsy. And, and uh, I, I kind of jumped in. Uh, my, my first store uh, was a was a total failure. Um, I was basically creating like tons of different t shirts and mugs with like silly quotes on them about being uh, in a relationship, uh, like being a husband, having a girlfriend, having a wife, being being a wife, that that sort of a thing. And I, I, I wasted a lot of money on on advertising, and 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 it was a abysmal failure. Um, I ended up. Well, it wasn't until like 2017 where I actually began to have some success. I had pivoted to uh, a more a more niche store. Um, I, I had created a store uh, ba basically for people that were like in recovery from, from drugs and alcohol. And uh, I had been, uh, you know, spending time getting the store together. And, and, and that was my first successful store. Um, I, I was running, you know, ads on social media with that store. I was using influencers. I was, you know, ordering samples and, and um, you know, running, running, a, running a store. I ran it for about a year. Um, I ended up selling it 
on the Shopify store exchange. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what that even is. They, they shut it down you know, a few years ago. It was a really awesome place where you could like, it was a, it was a marketplace for, for Shopify stores uh, where you could yeah, list so a store. It, yeah. It was, I think that was shut down. Yep. They, they, I don't know why they shut it down, but they, if you go to it on uh, their site, it says that it's been discontinued and there's other places where you can, you know, sell an online store uh, that exists like third party, you know, places. But uh, the, the, the Shopify one was really cool because it was very trustworthy, right? You were selling a store that was hosted on Shopify and, and uh, they handled all the transfers of the store and, and all of that. And, and, uh, I sold that store um, in uh, like early 2018, and and um, I guess uh, <laughs> the the rest is sort of history. I mean, that was a while ago, but I've had I've had a lot of stores since then. I've sold a total of three stores. Um, that kind of became my, you know, not not my go to strategy, but you know, like I said, the Shopify store exchange was an easy way to sell a store and. I, you know, kind of was in a little bit of a phase um, where I was building out a store and and getting it successful in some sense, and then and then and then selling it and opening a opening a new one. Um, currently, you know, we're in 2024. It's been about eight years. I, I have two stores. I'm I'm still on Shopify. I'm still, you know, big on you know high profit products, which I'm sure we'll talk about through this video today, and and um, social media marketing and all of that. And and uh, it's been a a wild ride uh, for for sure definitely sounds like it yeah that must have been crazy going back to the beginning like losing that business kind of i'm guessing yeah. it happened like overnight um yep. if I, really I, I i used to spend uh my my mornings uh, like drinking coffee and uh like going through uh, the ebay mobile app and like looking at sales notifications and instead of seeing sales notifications that morning, I was seeing notifications listing deactivated, listing deactivated, listing deactivated. Oh. And, and, uh, I also had an email stating some policy changes and, uh, basically they, they didn't like ban the eBay store. They just deactivated the listings and made it clear that if I published them again, that would be in violation. And so, so yeah, we overnight, uh, lost, lost that business. I had, like thousands of dollars in merchandise um, that I, you know, basically ended up throwing away um, because I didn't really know what to do with electronic cigarettes. I wasn't going to like bring them into, you know, some brick and mortar vape shop or something like that and, and try you to didn't sell smoke them. them all yourself. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was devastating, but at the same time it, it, you know, basically birthed my, you know, me discovering print on print on demand, you know? So in hindsight, you're probably not, not sad about it anymore. Like, oh, you, you're glad that yes. it's made you do the shift. Definitely. Yeah, or... yeah, definitely. No more inventory taking up an entire room in your house. <laughs> yeah. Especially once my daughter was born, I'm, I'm sure we would have had to find a different spot for, for the shipping room, you know? Well, you touched on it a little bit there with high profit items. Talk to me about the t-shirt trap, as you like to call yeah, it. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, people can sell whatever they want. Um, I, I, you know, make videos from time to time where, you know, like the title will say, don't sell t-shirts. And, and then in the video, I lay out like some different reasons that, that I think are legitimate things to, to think about, um, about choosing products. And, and, you know, people get really mad. So like, first and foremost, like anybody can sell anything they want. Uh, I do not, you know, wake up every day mad at people that sell t-shirts or anything like that. Um, but, um, you know, you know, ultimately with t-shirts, you know, first and foremost, um, they're, they're not a high profit item, you know, and I know that, you know, there could be people that maybe debate the actual profitability of it. I, I think when all is said and done, all of your fees, your, 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 your expenses, managing the business taxes, you're, you're probably looking at maybe five, $10 per, per shirt. And, you know, I, you know, have sold shirts. Like I said, my first, my first store ever sold shirts. And, um, after that, I was kind of tired of like, if I wanted to make a thousand dollars in profit, I would need to sell, you know, 200 shirts if I was making $5 in profit per shirt. Um, so, you know, first and foremost with high profit items, like you can make more profits in less time, right? Like you can, achieve more profits with less sales, right? Less sales also means less customer service potentially. And, 
Um, I'd rather sell products that, you know, make me 20, 30 or, or $40 or more in, in profit. And, 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 and those do exist. Like print on demand is massive. Now there are, you know, just in Printify alone, there's like over a thousand products that are, that are available. And I'm, and I'm sure we'll jump into, you know, some products at, at some point, but, mm. you know, products, profitability is, you know, definitely the first thing uh, around, you know, my reasoning for avoiding what I call the t-shirt trap, which is, which is what you asked about the t-shirt the t mm. trap is ba based on, you know, how, how competitive print on demand is, right? Like print, print on demand is one of the most popular ways to uh, make money online. If you look at the Google trend for print on demand, it has just been skyrocketing year after year. Um, I think, you know, if you look at, you know, just like user bases on a, you know, a platform like Etsy, um, back in, you know, 2019, there was less than 2 million sellers on Etsy. I think we're like approaching 10 million right now. Um, and, and the, the, the major advice that is really out there around shirts is, is for people to choose low competition niches uh, in order to stand out, right? Not, not in every case, right? Of course, you could have a great design in a high competition niche, but um, there, there's a lot of people that are, that are stuck trying to find the latest trend, uh, the latest low competition niche. Um, and that's what I call the t-shirt trap is you get trapped in that phase of like constantly trying to, you know, do something new to, to, you know, to stand out. And, you know, personally, I think low competition niches are low competition for a reason. Uh, there's potentially not that much demand. Maybe they don't have a lot of, you know, long-term potential either. Um, that kind of goes to like some of the different trends that, that, that emerge. And, and, um, you know, ultimately too, like I'm someone that sells products on Shopify. Um, I don't sell on a marketplace uh, like Amazon or Redbubble or, or, or Etsy. And, you know, when you're, when you're, and we'll I'm sure we'll talk more about differences between the two uh, at, at some point later, but you know, when, when you're building a Shopify store, like you're building a brand, you're building like something that should do something very specific. And, and there's a completely different mindset that you almost need to have when it comes to curating your product line, right? Like, so for, for example, like, let's say your niche is baking, right? Like, let's say you love baking and you're someone that bakes bread, you bake cupcakes, you make cakes, you bring, you know, tons of different things to the different holiday parties you go to and you love baking. Like, I don't think a great Shopify store is like bakingt-shirts.com where you have 138 baking t-shirts that have cupcakes with smiley faces on it and like silly puns about baking. Like, like instead, like, why not build a really cool brand that sells merchandise for people that love baking but instead of choosing shirts you choose some low competition items like print on demand cutting boards or kitchen decor items there is literally dozens of kitchen decor items out there you can get into personalization as well you could sell print on demand aprons and, and really create a cool brand um first right like and establish yourself as like a a, a cool store for people that love baking. And then if you wanted to have some t-shirt designs on there, you, you could, um, but they shouldn't be the star of the baking themed standing standalone store. You know, like that's, I guess the, the big distinction is, is what are you trying to build for your niche, you know, and how is it unique? Um, how are you building something specific? Um, if that, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And I like the fact that you point out, it's not that you're demonizing t-shirts. There's nothing yeah. wrong with them. Yeah. Just that there's obviously cons. There is downsides sure. to selling t-shirts, just like there's downsides to selling high products, uh, high uh, profit items as well, probably yeah. in, in some cases. Everything has their pros and cons. Um, and you're just sharing what works for you, which is totally legitimate. Like I mainly talk about t-shirts and low competition niches because that's working for me. Um, so it's not like one is terrible idea and one is the only idea you should follow one thing that i also remember from your recent video about this that i really liked is the idea that if someone is scrolling through social media for example and they see an ad for a t-shirt about their niche i think you said it's like a funny gym t-shirt yeah like yeah they might like it they might laugh at it but they don't necessarily need another t-shirt they've probably got 30 already or 40 or whatever sure. um whereas if you show them something unique like your example with the, was a custom sign for yeah. a gym where you can like change the name and everything, like a metal sign. That's probably an item that most people don't have yet, whether they have like a home gym or, um, or some place in the house where they can hang that up. 
Um, so it kind of, it, I guess it grabs more attention and it has more of that urgency. Like I actually need this thing. It's, it's, it's unique to me, to my interest where a t-shirt, like, yeah, it might be cool. It might be funny, but you already have a lot of t-shirts. So yep. it's not, there's not a lot, of, a lot of need for that. Yeah. Yeah, t- totally. Um, I always talk about, you know, and again, there's a, there's a definite distinction between like how you're selling print on demand items. If you're someone that's listing products on, on Amazon, for example, or wherever compared to like building your own store. And then like you said, you know, selling on social media, whether it's through ads, influencers, or, or just posting, like there's a, your, your customer is doing something very different when they see your item, right? When you're selling on social media, it's an impulse purchase, right? Cause they're not shopping. They're, you know, scrolling around, looking at memes or, you know, pictures of their family's vacation. They're not shopping. Right. And in a lot of cases, yes, people buy t-shirts, but they're, there's, they, they, you know, just like it's a fact that they're rather low in profit, they, they have a rather low perceived value. Right. So that, you know, idea that it's a great product for impulse purchases only, only goes so far, you know, depending on the niche and the, in the design that you're, that you're selling. And in the specific example you were talking about is, Kind of the same thing as like the baking example I gave, right? Where instead of creating a baking t-shirt with like a, you know, a, a, a cupcake design, and it, maybe it's a great design, maybe you're a great artist and it's, you know, just a funny design about baking, you know, you'll get a lot of likes maybe and people tagging their friends, but, you know, maybe the personalized apron with a really cool baking design on it would be better at, you know, generating the impulse purchase was, you know, basically the argument I was making in that, in that video. Yeah, it's a good argument. And one more thing I want to ask there is you mentioned, we talked a lot about Shopify stores. Um, do you also see uh, like good opportunity to sell these sort of items on Etsy? And how would you kind of compare the, the two there? Yeah, I mean, just full disclaimer, like I've not really sold on Etsy. Um, so I don't, I'm not an expert. So if there's someone watching and you are an expert or, or, or Philip, you know, I know you've sold on Etsy. So like at the end of the day, I don't know that my advice about you know, this is, is perfect, but, um, Etsy is a place where, you know, it's, it's like I mentioned with, you know, selling on social media, people are not shopping on social media. Uh, the exact opposite is true on Etsy. They are shopping, right? So if you're, if you're selling, you know, a product that no one is searching for on Etsy, even if it's a great item for your niche, and even if it might do really well in a social media environment with like impulse purchases and things like that, if no one's really searching for it on on Etsy, then it's probably not going to ever become like a bestseller for you. And there's definitely a lot of print on demand items out there that I would imagine don't get a lot of searches um, on on Etsy. Um, obviously, some of the ones I just talked about, uh, aprons and cutting boards, like those could totally be, I would assume, you know, high intent items on or high highly searched for items on on Etsy, but. Um, you start going through print on demand supplier catalogs and you see all that's out there. I'd, I'd imagine a very vast majority of those items are not typically searched for, you know? So I, I think it would come down to is, is the item you're choosing a good fit for your niche if you were going to list it on Etsy? And then secondly, like, are people actually searching for that? Um, Cause if they're not, you're probably not going to make sales, you know? How should people choose a product then for their niche? Cause that's obviously a big part of this, this idea. Do you have any like research tips or anything you do yeah. before you set on a specific item? I always kind of joke uh, and I say there's no perfect way to like press a button and get a product idea, right? Like just like when you're creating designs, like you can do research, you can look at different things, but at the end of the day, like you have to think. Um, and and a lot of times when it comes to choosing a product, uh, what I what I try to do is I choose based on the niche, right? I, I think about the customer, uh, what makes sense for them like what type of niche are you selling to um, are there are there any specific ways that someone in that niche is already using products in their life in some way that exist via a print on demand supplier for example like if your niche is gaming like don't do print on demand shower curtains that's kind of random for the gaming niche like instead like Game think about all of shower. <laughs> yeah true oh, no i'm just kidding I, I used to be a big gamer back in the day and, and uh, I, I think i yeah. pride, pride myself on on hygiene but i know i know you're just kidding um it, but like instead of a shower curtain like think about all of the of the and if someone's watching and you're not aware of these like go into a print on demand supplier and look at just how many products would exist that someone could use in their in their game room for example 
whether it's stuff for the wall, whether it's things on the desk, uh, whether whether it's you know even a a, print, a, a doormat right that's a, in their game room or something personalized. Maybe it says Philips game room established whenever you know. Um, and create yourself a store that really caters to gamers and lets them create their dream game room, you know? And then if you wanted to at some point have like t-shirt designs in there that, that then you could, but um, if you're going after, you know, more unique items and more high profit things, like think about your niche, right? I gave the, you know, the baking example with the cutting boards, the aprons, the kitchen decor, you know, another one, maybe your niche is like people that are sports moms, baseball moms, football moms, like, what types of things do they already buy for game day that are available through print on demand suppliers, like a, a tumbler that just says something about being a baseball mom, or maybe you personalize it to get more profit where they have the child's last name and Jersey number on it, or some sort of a, you know, print, print on demand apparel is so much bigger than t-shirts now too. Like there is just tons of really awesome all over print items. You can do, all over print t-shirts that look like a sports jersey, for example, and sell custom jerseys. There actually are, like within Printify, print on demand baseball jerseys that you could create for that mom. Um, nice. You could create blankets for game day and shoes for game day. And uh, it, it, like, I, like I said, it really comes down to thinking about your niche. And there's not a perfect way to explain that, just like when it comes to, you know, teaching someone to you know, make a great design, like you have to think and, and, you know, depending on your niche, like what makes sense for them? How do they already showcase things about their niche? Um, one other, you know, thing, I hope this isn't confusing to anybody, but I, I kind of think of niches sometimes like, um, some, so sometimes you have like a niche that's really proud, you know, like a, like a bragging type of niche, um, not, not bragging in a negative way, but like a really proud niche, like a niche that maybe, would like to have products that other people see, right? So I talked about like the sports mom, all of those examples, like people are seeing those, that's a proud niche. But like, what if the niche is people that love to read books? Like, I don't know that that's actually like a proud niche. It's more of like a humble niche, right? And the way that I think of that is like, why not create things that are just kind of like in the house you know, that people don't really see a lot? Not that proud niches couldn't have home decor, but like products for the reading room, for example. Um, maybe comfy apparel, like print on demand pajamas or slippers or blankets and pillows and things like that. Right. So, you know, that's, that's something else you can think of is like, is the niche really bragging or is it more humble? Um, would you see it on a bumper sticker or would you see it on a little sign in your grandmother's bathroom, um, as a little decor piece, you know, that's a really good point. I never thought, thought about it from that angle. One that I heard of recently is custom shaped pillows where you can literally yep. have them like shaped as an animal or something like that uh, yeah there yeah. we go <laughs> you've yeah. literally got them in the background yeah um, so that's kind of a unique product as well um yeah really cool ideas there where oh, you've done a lot of tests haven't you with uh different products and and uh unboxing them like wearing them stuff yeah. like that yeah where in your opinion can you source them the best what are some of the best print and demand companies yeah, I've, um, you know, you mentioned unboxings and things like that. That's, that's really been like, you know, one of the, one of the key parts of what I, what I try to do on YouTube is like show products that people don't really know exist. Um, and I've, I've got, you know, literally hundreds of print on demand samples. Um, it, it drives, it drives my wife crazy because in our, in our basement, right on the other side of this wall, um, I've got just this pile of, samples um it started with just a couple of storage bins and now they're like overflowing and some of it's on the floor and and uh and 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 I've reviewed lots of samples and made lots of videos and there's and there's also you know there's over 400 print on demand suppliers that exist and I'm not sure if people if people know that like if you go into the Shopify app store and you type in print on demand uh, there will be over 400 results um and and I have not used all 400 so um you asked for the best I'm going to give you my top 4 uh, they are they are not necessarily meant to be the only four. If there's a supplier that someone watching likes, like I'm sure they create great products. But the the four that I've had uh, the most success with and the most experience with uh, would be uh, first and foremost Printify. I'm sure everybody here wa watching has seen Printify before. Um, Who's that? I'm I'm sure the majority of people maybe have only gone as far as like their t-shirt hoodie tank top and mug categories. Like I would say, get your hands dirty a little bit and like 
start clicking through their catalog. They have over a thousand items in there. They, they ship products from all over the world, everything from really unique, all over printed apparel, like some of the ones I mentioned earlier and home decor stuff and accessories and products for the, for pets and products for your car as well. They have like print on demand license plates and uh, seat covers, headrest covers. Uh, they have those auto sun shades that you put in the dashboard of your car as well on a really hot day. Um, another supplier would be T launch. Uh, T launch has been around for a really long time. They have like all of your, you know, really staple type items, hoodies, t-shirts, tanks, things like that. But they also have a lot of really unique stuff. They have an entire line of like sports balls, everything from baseballs to volleyballs and golf balls that you can put print on demand designs on. They have one of the, one of the most uh, dynamic drinkware lines that I've seen. Lots of different styles of like stainless steel engraver, engraved tumblers. In terms of blankets and wall decor, I think they're, I think they're, you know, definitely a good supplier as well. Um, Subliminator is a uh, print-on-demand company out of China. Uh, they're they're currently only available um, on Shopify. So if someone's watching and you're, you know, selling somewhere besides Shopify, Subliminator would not be one you could you could use. Um, and I'm 99% sure that their that their Etsy integration is not ready yet. So if so if it is, I apologize, but. Uh, Subliminator is based in China. They are they are a they are a company though that is uh, headquartered in the Netherlands. Their their factory is in China, uh, and they really specialize in like all over print apparel. Uh, meaning, you're, you're familiar with all over print, right? Yeah, of course. Um, like if anybody watching, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. If anybody's watching and they're and you're not, think about it like like a regular T-shirt or a hoodie. Like your design is right here, all over print. Your design is everywhere. You you control every pixel of that product. Everything from a you know a print on demand pair of leggings or an all over printed shirt or an all over printed hoodie. Uh, Subliminator has a a lot of really unique all over print print stuff. Uh, button down short sleeve shirts and long sleeve shirts that are buttoned down. They've got an entire line of different sports jerseys and they just launched shoes recently. Uh, it's a really really cool supplier. Um, and then, and then fourthly would be a, a print on demand company called shine on. Uh, they, they used to really only do uh, print on demand jewelry, uh, everything from bracelets and, and necklaces and dog tags and, you know, necklaces with a, with a cross on them. And they have, they have print on demand watches as well, both where you can print on the bottom of the watch with like an engraving, but also on the face of the watch, like where the act, where you're actually telling the time. Oh, really um, cool. They also launched um, a lot of really cool home decor items for the wall, different blankets. Uh, they have leather journals now as well that are like engravable. Uh, they, they have a facility in the United States and then another one um, in the EU somewhere as well. So depending on where you're selling, you can, you know, kind of, you know, pick and choose where it's shipping from, which is, which is cool. So those would be my, I guess my top four um, that I've, that oh. I've had a lot of experience with. There's a lot of products there that I've never really heard of or seen myself, even on Printify. But Amazon Merch is my main focus, and there you're like sure. completely limited, aren't you? Sure. Um, but yeah, those sound like very, very uh, cool products. And Printify just um, it's not it's not something I've looked too much into, but um, I'm pretty sure they are, they either just launched or in the process of launching their their Amazon integration. Amazon Seller Central with print with Printify. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, they they've been behind on that, haven't they? Printful's had that for ages, I think. Yeah, uh, I think so. That, I think so. That's it's exciting not some... for anyone who wants to try that out. The all over print as well. Um, that's probably a good one to charge like a premium on because you're literally printing on the entire product, right? R rather than having like a small area. Um, so yeah. I could imagine some of those, um, whatever it is, like a jersey or like a, an all over print T-shirt is probably a lot more expensive, and people are a lot more open to to paying a lot of money for that than just a normal print right yeah i um recently um made made some videos showing uh some some stores that are, are selling in like some really competitive niches um but they're doing like all over printed t-shirts all over printed hoodies and 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 you're right they can sell those at a higher price like personally i've sold all over printed hoodies really well at like 59 dollars uh, which if you're doing like a, a regular hoodie you're probably not selling that hoodie for 59. Um, maybe if your really? design was like, you know, a full on illustration and you were like super talented, maybe, but like, that's probably a, a stretch. So, you know, you're right. Uh, the, the second thing about all of print is you can do something a lot more unique 
with your design. Um, not that you need to create this design that's like super busy and like over the top or anything, but just like just the simple fact of like creating a all over printed hoodie, for example, you can print on every single pixel of that hoodie, which means your your hood could have a design on it. It could also just be a solid color. Like when, when I've done hoodies, what I try to do is have like a base color on the front and the back, and then your sleeve, your front pocket, and your hood all sort of match to just kind of create a cool hoodie. Let's say you're in the hunting niche, for example, your sleeves, your hood, your front pocket could all be camouflaged, and then the front and the back could be black, and then you have like a traditional t-shirt graphic right here, but you've now created a really cool hoodie because the sleeves, the hood, and the front pocket are camo, right? And so the you have a huge amount of freedom with the with the with the design so that way you can create something cooler but then like you said those products will sell for for more because there's you know it's ultimately a more unique hoodie really opens the possibility i think for creative people to yeah. to go all out with that one thing that just came to mind for me is uh halloween costume designs which yeah. on amazon merch they do really well but you're very restricted with the print area right if you did sure. one of those on overprint an entire costume That'd yeah. be a lot cooler and probably see a lot more interest as well, I would guess. Yeah. One of the um, concepts that I had, uh, this was this was back in probably 2019, I think. Um, I, I had a store uh, doing all over print uh, sweatshirts. Uh, so they were like long sleeve sweatshirts, um, not hoodies, but like a sweatshirt. And um, they were all over print. And, and I was making the designs like an, like an ugly Christmas sweater, right? It wasn't actually knitted. But the whole thing had that knit effect on it. This is this is you know if anybody watching, just jump on Google, type in like ugly Christmas sweater plus Shopify or something like that, and you'll likely see tons of stores doing this. Where you know just just like you said, Halloween costumes or like I said, the ugly Christmas sweaters. Like the all of a print opens so many doors, and people do that with like T-shirts and with regular hoodies and regular shirts, where they do like an ugly Christmas style design where it's like it looks like it's stitched but it's just in the design like with all of a print you can do that on the entire thing um, and, it, and it opens a lot of doors for sure so from your past experience of opening uh, multiple shopify stores building them up um at the beginning phase once you found a few products is it true that you usually have to test for a while to figure out which one actually works the best for your niche in terms of like product type like like if, if you're trying to decide like oh does cutting boards or does aprons work the best like like probably not you know um i think you could pivot around a little bit to like figure out what's going to work for your niche but i would kind of you know i would kind of just say like no matter what you're doing whether it's you know building a shopify store or selling on amazon or, or selling on etsy there's i don't know if this is going to make me unpopular or not philip but you're, you're probably going to fail in some capacity at the beginning, yeah. right? Um, I would imagine that the products that you are currently selling on a daily basis were not products that you created on day one, right? Most people, I, I can't guarantee anything, but I can almost guarantee that anybody that's making daily print-on-demand sales, the products that they're actually selling were not ones that they created at the beginning, right? So there's there's always going to be some sort of testing phase. There's always going to be some sort of pivoting phase where you know, maybe you do start with cutting boards for your baking niche, but then, you know, you try an apron design and that does much better and you, you know, end up pivoting, pivoting to that. Um, I think it's, you know, it, you know, for, for me, um, like with, I, I, I have two stores. One of them I just launched in April. Um, it is a product-based store. It basically just sells wall decor for a few different niches. Um, and when I started the store, I, was starting with a with a niche. It was a like a coastal themed niche. So like the designs had like lighthouses and sailboats and lobsters and different things in it. And uh, I also did a lot of like farming stuff. And when I and when I when I opened, I didn't the, the coastal stuff was kind of a dud, and the farming stuff did really well. And so I just kind of went all in on the farming stuff, right? So like there's there's always going to be some some pivoting, and sometimes it's between products, sometimes it's between niches potentially. Sometimes it's between just design concepts. Um, and, and I would say, you know, anybody that is getting started at the beginning, like don't view, you know, any situation where you have to like pivot in some way as like a bad thing, right? Because that's probably going to happen no matter what you do. Now, that's exactly what I wanted you to say. It's, it's normal to fail at the beginning. And yeah. yeah, you might try 
all over print products now after getting excited from this uh, from this podcast but maybe it doesn't work for the niche that you choose you, you don't know sure. until you've tried it right and then you might yeah. have to test a different product or maybe eventually you have to test a different niche yeah. um and sometimes yeah that it does take a few months might even take a few years you never really know uh, it's different for everyone like it took me a year and a half to to see some proper results on amazon merch um and i think it's probably no different uh, for anyone on Shopify. Some people are faster, some people are slower. One of the analogies I always give is um, it's, like, it's like when if, if you were someone that, you know, needed to start working out and eating healthy, right? You're probably not going to hit your weight loss goal in your first 30 days. Um, you might even gain weight in your first 30 days, right? But the idea is if you can figure out how to work out effectively and eat a good diet that is conducive to weight loss, you, you will lose weight, right? And so whether you're, and, and sometimes it takes you a little bit of time to figure that out, right? And the same thing is true with, with print on demand. If you create a great store, you choose good products, you choose good niches, and you make good designs, they will sell. Um, sometimes it takes you a little bit of time, though, to figure out how to, how to do that. And that's, and that's okay. That's a really good analogy, I think, because I think a lot of, or one big issue about losing weight or changing your diet to lose weight is finding meals that are healthier but that you still enjoy and you just can't do that from day one if you've been eating rubbish for ages so in that phase where you're trying to work out and find meals and improve your cooking that's when you're creating a lot of bad meals and it's like easy for you to fall back that's kind of the creating bad t-shirt designs or creating or using the wrong product similarity yeah. right and then eventually you find some meals that you really love and then it suddenly becomes easier to lose weight and to stay on a healthy diet. And that's when, with the printed demand store, like sales start to actually trickle in more often. Yep, exactly. The big question uh, that I think most people struggle with, at least on the Shopify route, is how to drive traffic. Yeah, big question. Um, I, I think first and foremost, you, you have to decide, like, is Shopify right for you? You know, um, and, I, and I think this whole you know, like Etsy versus Shopify debate uh, is, is something that m maybe 90% of the people that are talking about it, like don't quite understand. And, and what I mean by that is it's not Shopify versus Etsy. Uh, it is, it is business versus business. They are, they are two completely different businesses. Even if you're someone on, you know, Amazon versus Shopify, right? They're, they're two different businesses. And, and the, the, what I always say is that print on demand is, the vehicle that we are using to either create an Amazon or an Etsy store or, or a, you know, a Shopify store. And they're both going to have completely different strategies that, that are, that are a part, you know, of being successful with either of them. Um, and when it comes to, you know, Shopify, I always say that the easy part is getting traffic. Um, and, and a lot of people think that's the hard part um, of, you know, running a, running a, you know, a Shopify based business, right? They always say, well, yeah, I can build the store, but I still need to get my traffic. Right. And, um, traffic's the easy part. The hard part is the same thing as getting sales on Amazon or Etsy, which is creating a best-selling design, right? So if you're someone that has a best-selling design, right, the traffic is going to be the easy part. And then, you know, I'm not going to guarantee you results, but like the hard part is creating is creating the design. The easy part is the is the traffic. People are spending um, on average 145 minutes a day um, on social media. Um, last year, there was a, a Forbes article that I feature in some of my YouTube videos from time to time um, that over 100 million people uh, in the United States last year purchased a product, at least one product on social media. Um, one out of five sales that are happening on social media are happening on Facebook. Uh, Instagram is, is the second most popular social media platform for purchasing things um, and in that same article, I think it was like 77% of businesses are using social media to reach their customers. So this is not like, when it comes to getting traffic on social media, this is not like a secret thing that is like impossible to, to figure out. Um, it, it kind of boils down into three different strategies. And the, and the first is, is, is organic. I, I think organic traffic from social media is one of the most overlooked and unrecognized um, traffic sources. Um, I, I talked about the t-shirt store uh, that I that I started at the beginning. Um, I, I would say 75% of the sales that I made on that store were, were from only organic traffic. Um, I, I don't think I've had a store no. 
that relied so heavily on organic traffic since. Um, it's always been a part of of what I've done. But when you're when you're trying to get traffic from social media, the first step is to create social media pages, right? Like a Facebook page, an Instagram page. You know, there there was someone that I was talking to yesterday that their niche is really on Twitter a lot, so that's where you know they're focusing on a content strategy. Uh, maybe your niche is on Pinterest, like maybe that's where you should focus on a content strategy. But the but the idea is to create an account that people in your niche want to follow uh, as, you know, square one. And this is, you know, definitely a long-term play. It's not like you're going to start your social media page. You're going to post eight times and you're going to have a thousand followers. Like there's a good chance you're going to post eight times and you're going to get zero followers. <laughs> but the idea is you need to start that process and, you need to be consistent. Um, I have found that the more consistent I am and the and the more I try to upload great content, whether it's memes or just something funny or something interesting, a fun fact about the niche on, on Instagram or something, like the, the, the traffic is there, right? And so organic is is the first step. Um, I, I am also someone that I, I love running ads on, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, if, you, if you're watching this and as soon as I said ads, you panicked, um, don't because the the big myth is that you need to have like thousands of dollars to use Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, every ad that I start starts at a dollar a day. Um, budget is not something that is going to necessarily increase the probability that that you are making sales. Yes, if you have a higher budget, you're showing the ad to more people. But on an individual level, each person still has the same likelihood to buy, whether your budget is a dollar or a thousand dollars, right? And uh, what's really cool, I guess, like for, for me with Facebook and Instagram ads is when you're a little bit tough to just talk about it and not like show, right? But like inside of your ads manager, you build an audience and your your audience is who the ad is being shown to. And and you can you can target like some really specific keywords. Like the, the idea that I can run an ad for a dollar and have Facebook show it to people who like Harley Davidson, and then I'm making a hoodie that has a motorcycle theme design on it. Like that's a really powerful thing. Um, and it's not as hard as, you know, some people think. And, and just like anything, there's going to be, you know, a learning curve at the beginning. I would say, you know, running an ad on social media is not any more difficult than figuring out SEO on a POD marketplace. Um, if you can put time into researching keywords and tags, you can put time into researching building an audience for a $1 Facebook ad, for example. You know, the third traffic source is is influencer marketing. Um, this is something that I've, I mentioned that I started a new store back in April. Um, this is something that I've, um, for the for the first time, made like the number one traffic source of a store uh, that I've, that I've ran. Um, I've used influencers a lot. It's never been a focus though, like it has been with this store. Um, the, 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 I, like I've been able to, like, and, and when I say influencer as well, I'm not talking about like anybody watching uh, like celebrities um, or like fitness models or people that have a million followers on TikTok because they went viral doing a funny dance. Like I'm talking about like content creators in your niche. Um, one of the, one of the examples I I always give is like if your niche is gardening, there's likely someone on Instagram who has an account where maybe it's like Becky's Garden and she is out in her garden every day giving people gardening related tips. And maybe she has 32,000 followers, right? And it would be extremely powerful if you sent her a free sample of your leggings and then she made a video wearing the leggings and told people to go check out your store to get their own and gave them maybe a 15% discount code. Like that's what I'm currently doing with, with, my, with my new store that I started in April as a primary traffic source. Um, what, what I've done though is I've taken it a step further where... There's different Shopify apps that you can use to manage this. You can also just manage it manually. But uh, when they promote that discount code to their audience, if someone uses it, they actually earn a commission um, on the sale. And so I'm now in a position where I have these people out there that are incentivized once a week to promote my items because they know every time they sell something, they, they earn a commission on it, right? And they're monetizing their account through that, through that way, right? And and um, that that's, I think, probably something that a lot of beginners maybe wouldn't jump into because it's you talking to a real person and kind of coming up with some sort of a of, a, of an arrangement. But it's, uh, you know, for anybody that is looking to build their own brand, like influencer marketing is is a, is a major way that you can flood your store with traffic. Um, and, 
the way that I do it is I just send a sample and I set up those commissions and it works quite good. It's, it's good that you mentioned the affiliate aspect there of giving them like a an affiliate link that the sales yep. get tracked through, they get an extra cut. So it's more of an incentive rather than just saying, oh, here's a free sample. Can you promote my product? Because yep. I'm guessing it's probably also a bit difficult to get a hold of them sometimes. Like the bigger the pages oh, yeah. get, the more messages they'll receive. Uh, what's yep. like, is there like a threshold where you start messaging people? Is it like 10K followers or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I basically have the mindset that anybody that, Anybody that has like over a hundred thousand followers might not want to just promote your item for a free sample. Now, there's a there's a high chance that that person is probably already doing something with other brands where maybe it's more worth their time to focus on that than to work with you to promote the sample. So, so I typically look for what's called like a micro influencer. Um, I start around like maybe 10,000 followers as a minimum. I would say like around 50,000 is a is a sweet spot. Um, to, to work with because those are people that I don't want to make like, um, like, like general assumptions. Um, but you know, those are people that are likely a little bit more hungry. They're, you know, really maybe haven't monetized their account in a, in a really, you know, big way yet. And, um, they might be really, you know, more likely to be willing to work with you, um, and to receive your sample and, and take the time to promote it, uh, without actually getting any, any sort of payment up front. Um, one of my best influencers, I started with her um, back in April when I started the store and she had like 8,000 followers and you know, she's now up around like 20,000. Um, so I've kind of, I guess, grown with her in a way. And it's kind of like, um, it's only going to give me more ROI. I've, I've sent her multiple samples at this point because she does a good job at like showing the products and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, like a, like a smaller account is, is better. And when I say small, I don't mean like 500 followers. I mean like 20,000 or 60,000 or something uh, like that. And that can also be done, um, you know, on, on YouTube as well. Um, I have someone I've, I'm working with one influencer who, uh, is on, is on YouTube. They have about 50,000 subscribers. They're, they're in my niche. I mentioned I was doing like some farming related stuff. So they have a channel uh, that is all about their own farm. Um, and I sell wall decor for people that are, you know, interested in farming. And I sent them a sample of the wall decor, decor and they hung it on their garden fence. And uh, in their videos, when they walk by it, they tell people that they can go to the link in the description and use their discount code to save money on their own custom sign. You know, and it works really well. So um, like I said, it's a very underutilized traffic source. And, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a way that you can quite literally get lots of people on your store very quickly. It sounds like a great alternative for people that don't want to spend all the energy building their own page. Cause like you said, that takes time. Yeah. You, know, you might do eight posts and get no followers. Yep. Whereas here you're using other people's followers, uh, you're giving them an incentive and you kind of shortcut that process. But I'm glad you mentioned that the, that it even works with smaller pages because when I hear influencer marketing, my assumption is you have to pay a lot of money up front and send free samples. But no, you're right. Some of these smaller pages, if they're just recently, if they've just recently become big, this might be one of their first opportunities to to make money. So that's a good strategy, and you have to remember they can also grow with time, right? And there's definitely people out there that, you know, like, like I've paid money too for for promotions. Like, like, like there are like I've not taken people up on these offers, but like I've had people tell me that like if you want me to promote your product, I, I need a thousand dollars up front or something, and. No, that's not ever ever been something that I wanted to do with a with a print on demand item. But I but I have paid um, several hundred dollars for for a promotion. Uh, there was a uh, I made a YouTube video about this recently, like selling like um, U.S. election based merchandise um, back in back in 2020. I I, I had um, s several products that I was doing based on the 2020 election, and I was working with politically based social media pages and and paying them fees up front to have them promote products to, you know, their, their followers. Um, and so there, there are going to be accounts out there that do charge a lot. And, and in some cases it's worth it, right? Cause if you have an account where they have, you know, maybe 120,000 followers or something, and they want $300 to promote the product, like there's nowhere else in the world that you can spend $300 and, and potentially show the item to a hundred thousand people. Um, that's some of the best marketing uh, ROI that you could potentially have, but in, but in a lot of cases, it's you know maybe not the best use of your time to be spending that much money with multiple people every single day. Um, if your store if your store is new, 
One thing I want to backtrack to a little bit is the organic traffic if you want to build your own page, if some people are still interested in that. How do you kind of manage that? What's the strategy? You mentioned sharing funny images, memes. How do you go from that to build an audience to actually promoting your products? Do you just do posts? Do you, do you leave a link in the bio? Like what's, what's Yeah, the link in the bio. Um, it, it's really not super complicated. I would say what I always try to do is like batch content. Um, so you're not like every single day waking up and thinking like, what am I going to post today? You know, like when I say the word content strategy, like that just means like being intentional with your content. So first and foremost, maybe figure out how many times a day do you want to post? Um, and then if the answer is twice, well, then maybe try to go get 14 days of content, which is 28 pieces of content. And, you know, maybe seven of them could be memes about your niche. Maybe seven of them could be some sort of viral, you know, video or image or something that you're kind of like, curating onto your to your page um, you could also do I, I mentioned fun facts like you could go on google and type in like fun facts about niche whatever your niche is and then create a graphic about that fun fact and um, maybe there's you know another concept that i've used is like on this day type stuff like let's say your niche is sports like go look up something that happened as we're making this video philip it's august 20th so what happened in sports on august 20th in history and go find something interesting and make a post about that, that, that thing, you know, and post it on August 20th. Give people value, right? You want them to, to give, gain some knowledge. They learn some yeah. facts that they can maybe pass on to others or show off with, something like that. Yeah, you're, 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 you know, you're basically trying to create an account that people in your niche want to follow. Um, if all you do is post mock-ups of your products, no one wants to follow that. And you're likely not going to get any engagement on the social media platform, which is me, which means you're not going to grow, right? If, if you're posting on Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest or TikTok, um, the only thing that's ever going to get you to grow is if, if is if you get engagement and you, and you get engagement when you post things that are that are interesting. Um, I always uh, I have I have a a strategy. I guess it's I I call it like when I train about it, when I teach about it, I, I call it growth hacks at the beginning. Um, where you can like, let's just use Instagram, for example, go look at like popular pages in your niche. And again, this is not meant to be like a long-term strategy or like some secret strategy. When I say it, everyone's going to be like, really? Like that's your, that's your advice. But if you have zero followers, like go find a popular page in your, in your niche and go through the comments, people that are commenting on some of their posts and follow those people or like their comments or respond to their comments or even just comment on some of these really popular posts on other pages. If you interact with like a hundred accounts a day, maybe you'll get 15 followers out of it. And if you do that for two weeks, maybe that's your first hundred or your first 200 followers. And the idea is it's a growth hack, right? So that way you don't have to spend all this time getting zero followers. Like go do some of that just to get a hundred followers or 200 followers or something like that. And then that way, when you post, Maybe you get six likes instead of zero, and then your account kind of has a little bit of a uh, a jump start, I guess. Um, in terms of like, I think your original question was about like how do you transition from like posting and building an audience to like actually promoting. Um, the, the the question I get a lot is like how many followers do I need to promote products, and I don't think there's a a perfect answer. The way that I've always looked at it with my accounts is like if I feel like my account still needs to grow, if I feel like I'm not getting the engagement that I want, posting a picture of one of my products will not help me to grow, right? It really would just give me a quick hit of like dopamine if I made a sale, right? And it really wouldn't help the account grow. Um, like if you have a hundred followers and every time you post, you get two likes, posting a product's not really going to probably make your account go, go viral at this stage. Um, and so I guess the answer would be, you could do experiments, right? You could, I, I would say definitely don't make your account, you know, only in general post whenever you want, but have like an 80 to 80 to 20 ratio, right? 80% content, 20% product posts, right? And you could start those, I guess, whenever, but um, don't expect, you know, massive results. So, you know, one thing too, Philip, that you didn't ask about, but I, I think is valuable. Um, you've heard of like a retargeting ad before where like, if yeah. you're, if you're, if you're on a website and then you go back on, Facebook 
and then you see an ad for the product you were just looking at. Like that's called a retargeting ad. You can actually set those up to do the same thing if someone interacts with your social media page, right? So let's say you post a meme on Instagram and someone likes it and that's it. You can retarget them with an ad for your actual merchandise, right? So it kind of gives um, like an additional layer of significance to the content strategy. Let's say that you're, let's say you post a video and it goes viral and you get 10,000 views, right? Like maybe not super viral, but 10,000 views, right? Well, that's 10,000 people that you can now retarget with those retargeting ads. And you could spend like $2 a day on an ad like that, right? And so then you're not necessarily posting on the page, but everybody that's interacting with it, you know, they're members of your niche because they're interacting with your niche based content. And then they're seeing a retargeting ad, you know, for your, for your products. Right. So it kind of gives a extra layer, um, like I said, of significance to it, to doing it. It's kind of the difference between a cold lead, like a, a completely new person that's never seen your content or your page. Yeah. And here you've got maybe not a warm lead, but like lukewarm, right. They've interacted yeah. a bit. They've seen some of your stuff. Um, so there's a bigger likelihood, I guess, of them converting. Um, so that, that definitely makes sense. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, in terms of the paid ads, though, I think one thing that people struggle with a lot at the beginning, once they get into that, is that they might, for example, spend like $500 to test some ads, but they're not getting any sales, or maybe just one or two sales out of that. And then they're really frustrated and they, they think, okay, this is not for me, or they want to give up. Do you have any advice for those people? I would say, I don't know if this is advice or more of just a observation. Um, we, we were talking before we started recording um, about, about like my Facebook group. Um, I, I have a Facebook group. There's, you know, t almost a hundred thousand people there. And I, and I see a lot of stuff. I see a lot of really great stuff, but I also see a lot of not so great designs, uh, not so great stores. And, and I think there's a lot of people that maybe get themselves into the situation you just talked about, where all of a sudden they've spent 500 bucks and have no profits. I think that a lot of those, at least the cases that I've seen when I re like, I review stores, I have a I make a post today's Tuesday, I made it today, every every Tuesday, I make a post, it's called Tuesday store share, people share their URLs, and I review them in YouTube videos. And um, in a, a lot of cases, I would say 90% of them are probably stores that should not be promoting any of their products right now because they don't have things that I think will sell well, right? And not that my opinion is everything, right? That's just, it's just my opinion. But I think the majority of people that find themselves in that situation don't have, you know, best selling, best selling products, right? Just like if you're someone that's, you know, 300 designs deep into Amazon and you've sold one shirt, right? Like you probably don't have a great catalog of designs. Um, that's why I said earlier, like no matter your, if you're building a Shopify store, or if you're building a Etsy shop or whatever, like the most important part is creating something that someone will pay for. Um, having a winning product, which I sort of break down as the perfect combination of a niche, a product and a design. Um, if you do all three of those things well, like bad marketing will sell great products. Now, great marketing won't sell bad products, right? So um, first and foremost, if you have spent $500 or if you've heard of someone doing that, it would be just like if you opened a restaurant and the food wasn't any good, right? Like you could, you could do all the marketing in the world. People come in, but they don't order. That would be the main advice is like focus on your, on your menu, right? Just like if you are focusing on a, on a, on a, um, you know, on, on growing a restaurant. And then secondly too, like there's no reason to spend $500, especially if sales aren't happening. I mentioned, you know, I start every ad at a dollar. It might be impossible to talk through some of that just in this, in this capacity here, but, um, the fact is, is that after you spend a dollar, you should, you should through, through some testing, you can have a little bit of a, you know, inclination about the potential of the product. And then after that, I typically will launch a $5 a day ad. If that ad runs for like two or three days with no sales, it gets turned off. It doesn't run until it gets to $500. Um, if you had a hundred bucks in your marketing budget, you could likely test several different items and, and give yourself a really good gut check about what you have before you get to that point where you've, you know, I see posts where people will say, I spent $2,500 on ads. I had 8,600 people come to my store. I didn't get any purchases. What am I doing wrong? And I, and I always respond and I say, well, it sounds like 8,600 people decided not to buy your product, right? So your ad worked, right? Your ad got people to the store, but when they got there, they decided not to buy it, right? So focus there. Um, Hope that makes sense.
It does make sense. Um, it's very similar to something I've talked about recently on my channel with Amazon, Amazon Merch, um, where you're going to have to go through multiple designs and, and track the conversion rate. If the conversion rate is terrible, after some testing budget, just kill it. Like, don't marry the product, don't marry the design, whatever it is. If, if the customers don't like it, it's pointless. You have to move on to the next one and test at an affordable budget until you find something that converts well. That's when you can kind of open the floodgates and keep increasing daily budgets or bids or whatever it may be uh, to push that product further if it is converting well. And it sounds like that's exactly uh, the same or similar on Shopify with Facebook ads. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but like I, I sometimes will have like, like, like several iterations of the same design where I'll like be consistently, and this might be tougher for someone who doesn't have like a really solid graphic design capability, but a lot of times like a design that I'm selling really well is, is not the same design that it was at the beginning when I first put it on my store, meaning I'm constantly, not every product, but like there's certainly like a situation that I can think of specifically is I was, I've done a lot with like the military niche in general, um, different, different branches of the U.S. military, even just like not even branch specific, but just veteran specific things. Um, and I very vividly remember, and I've told this story before, so if anyone's ever heard it, excuse me, but um, the design had like a skull in it, right? It was like a veteran themed design. It had a skull and that was kind of like the focal point of the design. And I was getting tons of traffic from social media. I was making some sales, but I wasn't like super profitable. And I was like, what is going on? Like this design is awesome. I'm getting like really great uh, cost per click, right? Like a lot of people are coming to the store, but I'm just not converting. And I, and I decided to switch the skull for an eagle with the mindset that maybe people don't want to wear a skull, right? Maybe they think it's cool. They window shop it, but a skull is like a very, like, I guess like, um, it's a very bold fashion statement, I guess, you know? And so I switched it to an Eagle and then that design for that specific hoodie, the only thing that changed was the Eagle ultimately beca became one of my best sellers ever for the military niche with, with hoodies. Right. So I would say like, if you are marketing something and it's, or if you're listing it on Amazon and it's not selling, but it maybe is getting some traction, like what could you do to the design to make it better? Um, could be a could be a good place to start rather than just throwing it away, starting with a new niche or a new product or just a brand new design concept. Yeah, that's a really good point. Something similar happened to me recently as well with one of my ads that were doing well. Is I I realized that the AI version of the design did better. Like I, I recreated the original Illustrator type design as an AI design, or with the help of AI, combination of AI and uh, Illustrator and also tested that and it converted way better so then i turned those ads down the old ones and you know focus more on the ai design and then i also applied that strategy to some of my other niches where similar designs were working i was like okay i'll take these old designs i'll revamp them with this new style and they probably do better um so yeah interesting are there besides the things that we've already talked about are there some other beginner mistakes that you commonly see I think the, you know, one of them we kind of touched on is just like expecting, you know, print on demand to be like a lottery ticket, you know, print on demand is definitely not get rich quick. Uh, print on demand is a, is a real business, whether you're selling on Amazon, Etsy, Shopify, there are going to be expenses. Um, and at some point you likely will fail uh, in some capacity. And the key is to not look at that as career ending, but to almost expect some sort of failure. So that way when it, when it does happen, you can sort of adjust um, and figure out yeah, it sounds corny, but like try to learn from the failures, you know? Um, and, and then secondly, I think a beginner mistake is like being frantic, you know, with your, with your store. I sometimes, you know, whether it's a YouTube video that someone's commenting on or a Facebook post, or I'll receive an email from someone um, and they're frantic um, about trying to start their print on demand store yesterday, right? Where they feel like they need to go as quick as possible to, you know, get in, get into the world of, of POD. And, and you can't do that because again, you're, you're building a business. Um, I always say print on demand is never going to go out of style. And that's not meant to be like a, you know, that this is like a get rich quick type of thing, but like print on demand is 
just how we are fulfilling our products. Uh, we are creating apparel businesses or home decor businesses or accessory businesses, and those are going to exist forever, right? We're just using print on demand to do it. So there's there's no reason to be frantic. Um, I think in terms of like a really concrete mistake that I could see maybe some people making um, based on hearing this conversation today about like branching out from t-shirts and again if you want to sell shirts i'm not mad at you you can do you can sell whatever you want but like don't start selling you know shower curtains and blankets and posters and shoes and leggings and just take all of your t-shirt designs and just start putting them on those products like you're going to end up with lame shower curtains you're going to end up with lame blankets like you need to design specifically for the product you're creating right like if you're selling a doormat for example don't take your t-shirt PNG and put it on a black doormat. Like actually make a doormat that maybe has a background, maybe a border, maybe some really thoughtfully arranged graphic elements and text in the in the inside, right? Same thing for a blanket, same thing for a shower curtain. Like don't create a black shower curtain with a white t-shirt PNG graphic on it, right? Like actually design a nice shower curtain, fill your entire space in a in a thoughtful way. Um, I could see that being maybe a specific mistake that someone might make because I've definitely seen stores uh, like that where they've got 42 different product types and it's all the same design. I've I've made similar mistakes at the beginning. It's yeah. everyone goes through it. I, I've put t-shirt designs onto blankets and they haven't sold. So you have to make the mistakes to learn from them sometimes. But yep. that's why we try and point them out in these videos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's totally true. Failing is part of the process. Uh, the I sometimes use an acronym for it. Uh, first attempt in learning um so when, mm. whenever you fail it is just so that you learn and prevent that in future yeah it's, it's, i like that you shouldn't have this constant negative connotation if you fail then that's like you're doomed no this is actually a good thing you're going to level up through that failure so yeah thanks a lot for coming on of course it was a great conversation lots of good insight um lots of detail about marketing getting traffic as well organic traffic uh, which is awesome um and if people want to learn more from you or connect with you where where can they find you yeah i mean I, again philip thanks um I, I had i had fun um i can't even believe like a whole hour has gone by um, it was <laughs> really 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 awesome so thank you um and and then you know if anybody wants to look me up you can just type in joe robert on on youtube um i, I try to make two videos a week uh sharing like i mentioned um really cool products and you know i i've been uh, taking people like into my own print on demand store and showing things that I'm working on as well. And um, we also have a Facebook group for uh, it's called POD Ninjas. Uh, we have almost 100,000 members there. Uh, not everybody there is on Shopify either. There is a lot of Etsy and Amazon folks there too. So if that if Shopify and social media is not your cup of tea, there's probably something there for you too. You can look us up on Facebook. Like I said, it's POD Ninjas. Um, and um and yeah, that's really all the, the only places I'm at, though. Um, so if you want to okay. find me, that's where I am. All right. And um, I'll leave those in the description, of course, the cool. links Thank to you. those. And anyone who wants to have their shop reviewed as well, right? you mentioned that earlier, that's another option, um, yeah. which is cool. And yeah, thanks a lot for your time. It was a fun conversation. And yeah, hope to have you on again sometime. Sure, I'd love to. Thanks again.